Hey everyone, so welcome to this video on related rings. In the previous video, we took a more abstract look at sort of how this works, what kind of problems we solve with related, with related rates, and uh, a few other things. In this video, we're going to approach it with a more concrete problem-solving focus. Right. So not only are we going to work through this example together, but I'm also going to give you a sort of problem-solving guide for related rates that if you follow, uh, you will be in good shape for doing well in these questions. Okay. So let's get right into it. Uh, so let's looking at the prompt. Uh, we see a blue dot starts at the origin. It's moving along the plus y axis, right? Moving along the plus y axis. At the same time, a red dot starts at the origin. Is moving along the plus x axis, right? So that's that. Now at the moment when the blue dot has traveled five units, it's traveling at a speed of three units per second. Likewise, at the same moment, the red dot has traveled ten units, and it's traveling at one unit per second. And now the question we're being asked is how fast is the distance between the two dots changing at this instant when all this stuff is true, right? And that's a very common kind of problem that you, the common common kind of um, sort of type of question that you'll be asked in related rates, right? So it's going to set up a scenario where you have some stuff going on, and it's going to ask you about how fast, like this whatever quantity, this distance is changing at that particular instant. Like the general formula for how distance is changing is not often that helpful to us. So we're more interested in that instrument particularly. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. So the first step to this that I like to do is to set up what I call my general picture. General picture. Okay? Now the general picture uh, is just a sketch of what's going on. It's just a sketch of what's going on, but it contains, it has a few important things. So firstly, this only contains information that's true at every point of time, right? So let's write that out. It's true all the time, at every point of time. This instant, this, the information in this picture is true at every point. It's more general. Right? Um, the other thing is, it's the place where I like to put in my variables, right? So the variables that I use in my equation usually will go in this sketch. Right? So let's go ahead and do that. So if we drew this out, it's just going to be the xy plane. Okay. So we're going to have this red dot here that's moving along the x-axis at some speed. Okay, it's moving along the x-axis at some speed. Likewise, we have a blue dot here that's moving along the y-axis at some speed. Okay, and yeah, so that's that's the picture, and now we can throw in some variables here, right? So let's call this distance, um, the distance here. Let's call that y, and let's call this distance x. Okay. Likewise, we can also label the more important quantity that we're trying to solve for, which is this distance here between these two between the two dots, which we'll call z. Is there anything else we can put in here? Well, not really, right? So the only time you would really put in more information to this picture is if you had something like a constant rate of change or like a, a given distance that doesn't change, right? In this case, we don't have any of that, so this is our general picture. The next thing we're gonna do is something called a snapshot picture. Now, what's a snapshot picture? Well, that tells us what's going on at one specific instant of time, right? So this picture tells us info. It's true at just one instant of time. That's opposed to the general picture, where if you look here, we don't, like, we've been very, like, very um, general. So, like, there's nothing here that we've really, like, we've not assigned any, like, numbers to this. We we're just saying that this is x is y that's c and this is going to be true at any point of time and it's it's vague that's the whole point but it's true at every point of time the snapshot picture contains things that might not be true at every point of time but it's true at just this one instant of time that we're interested in and it's a lot more specific though it gives us a lot more numbers and a lot more uh, useful information though, right? so the specific instant we are interested in in this particular problem is it comes from our problem statement Right? It's your, the instant of time you're interested in will always come from your problem statement. For us, that's going to be 
um, when the blue dot has traveled five units and the red dot has traveled 10 units, right? So that's specific instant of time. So in other words, it's when X is equal to 10 and what's this, Y is equal to five. Right? So this is a specific instant of time when that's true, right? So I know those are not time values, but the specific moment when these two things are happening is the moment we're interested in, okay? So let's draw that out. So we still have the red dot doing this, going that way. We also still have the blue dot going up this way. Right? But now we can do something, we can be a little bit more specific. So this distance right here, it's not just y, but we know that it's going to be 5. right? Specifically, it's 5 units, if we're keeping the units, but it's 5. Likewise, this distance, it's not just x, but it's actually 10. I know that's not drawn to scale, but it's, it's fine. Cool, so now we have this stuff. What else do we know that we can put in here, right? Well, let's go back to the problem statement and see if there's anything else we could put in here. And aha, you see, we're given some rates, right? So we're given that at this moment, the blue dot is traveling at three units per second and the red dot is traveling at one unit per second, right? So we can throw those in there as well. So the red dot is traveling at one unit per second. That means that if this side is x, then we know that dx dt, right? Or the change in x is going to be uh, one unit per second. Now let's take a quick pause here. And let me ask you, is this number going to be positive or negative? Well, let's think about, and this is actually not something that's directly given to you, so don't just say positive by default. We'll have to actually look at our picture and confirm that it's positive or negative, right? So let's look at our picture and see what's happening, right? So if we come down here, you'll notice that as this dot keeps moving to the right, this distance that we've called x, right, this distance that we've called x is getting bigger, right? So if the dot were over here, then the value of x would be a much bigger, right? So as this dot keeps moving, x is getting bigger. So therefore, dx dt is going to be positive. And I say check it like that just because there will be some cases where it can be very confusing because it's counterintuitive, especially if you've, if you've taken physics classes or things like that. It's very counterintuitive to what you might expect. So always follow that logic, right? So. Look at, look at the rate, see if it's causing your whatever side length to increase or decrease in size, okay? And that will tell you. Same thing for y, right? So if we look at y, we see that as this dot keeps moving up, the side length that we've called y is getting bigger. So dy dt is also gonna be positive and specifically it's going to be um, three units per second. So it's gonna be plus three. And of course, we have our z in there as well. Okay, that's our pictures. And now we've all we've done really is just take information from our from this paragraph here and put it into some pictures. And now this is a good place from where we can actually kickstart and start writing some equations and uh, and may, and then uh, get some answers here. But always have these pictures. I know it can be time consuming, but have these pictures on there. It'll help whoever's grading your exam, like follow your work better and give you more partial credit if you make something, you make a mistake somewhere. And also it helps you, because as you go through your work, you can quickly check back here and make sure that everything that's going on makes sense, okay? All right, so we've got those. Now our third step is going to be to quickly state a goal. Right? I like to state a quick goal at the beginning of all these kinds of problems just because, again, that helps us like um, stay grounded, make sure we're, we know what we're doing. Just like with optimization, helps us make sure that we know exact, we're solving for exactly what the problem is asking us to solve. In this case, we're being asked to find uh, how the distance between the two dots is changing. So looking at this picture here, we want to find dz dt. But not just dz dt, 
in general, we want to find specific DZDT specifically when, um, or at the instant when, uh, let's see, when x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 5. And we want to find DZDT at the specific instant. Cool. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put together some equations. Right? And with these equations, you always want to base them off of your general picture. The reason for this is your general picture contains uh, its your most well general idea right? is your most general understanding of the problem. It contains things that are true at any point of time. So if you use this, you are creating an equation essentially that holds true at any point of time, which is mathematically correct for you to use, right? Because if you look at your uh, snapshot picture for this step, you might accidentally like you know plug in a number where you don't you're not supposed to plug in a number, right? Because when you're with these equations, you want to keep everything as general as possible until the time comes in to plug in these numbers. Okay, so always start your equation at the general picture, right? And so if we look up here, we can see that we're interested in z, so our equation is just going to be uh, x squared plus y squared equals z squared with logarithm theorem. Okay. And now our next step is going to be to make this equation move, so to say. In other words, we're going to take our derivative with respect to time. And remember, this is that whole connection we made between this kind of a static equation and the idea of you know how something is changing, right? This taking this derivative with respect to time. And for this, of course, don't forget, you will need to use implicit differentiation. You will need to use implicit differentiation. So be very careful. So the math associated with related rates is generally not as tedious, as, as messy as it can get with optimization, but on the other hand, it's a little bit more advanced. So you do need to know implicit differentiation to do this. Um, and yeah, so make sure you are very familiar with that. Okay. So let's do that though. So derivative of 2x with respect to t, we're going to get uh, 2x times uh, a dx dt. Yeah. Then we will have a 2y dy dt. And then all this is going to equal 2z. And here's the quantity we really are interested in, which is going to be dz dt. That's the guy we're really trying to solve for. So one thing we can do now is we can just go ahead and quickly cancel these twos and we can rewrite the equation after that. Okay. Cancel those out and we can rewrite the equation. Excellent. So the next thing we want to do after this is we want to plug in our specific info. Right? We want to plug in specific information. Specifically, this is going to be at the time, the instant of information that's from the instant of time that we are interested in. So this is where we start to look at our snapshot picture. Because right? up till here, it's all been in terms of the general picture, right? But now that we've taken our derivatives, now is the time where we actually go into our snapshot picture and plug things in, right? So at this time, I also like to do a quick spot check just to see what quantities I know in my snapshot pictures and what things I need to calculate. Because if that's, there, there will be some times where there's one of these quantities are, it might need to might need a few extra steps of work to find, right? So I'm going to take a quick second here and see what quantities I'm given and what I might need to calculate. Okay, so let's look up here real quick. If we take a quick look at our snapshot picture, right? Um, we'll see we have x, y, dy, dx, dy, dt, dx, dt. So uh, what we've got here, so we've got x, right? That's something that's given to us. dx, dt, given to us. y, given to us. dy, dt, given to us. dz, dt, uh, we're trying to solve for, so we don't really need to know what that is right now. The z quantity, however, we don't know immediately, right? So we don't really know what that is right now. So we're going to need to have to cal we're going to need to calculate that before we can complete the next step. So let's come back up here to our snapshot picture. Right? So if we look up here, um, well, how could we find the side z? Well, 
we know what x and y are, right? So we can just apply our Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, and we can figure out what that is, right? So what you're going to get is that z is going to be the square root of um, 10 squared plus 5 squared, which is going to be square root of 125, which actually very nicely comes out to 5 root 5. Awesome. So now that we have that, we can bring that guy down here and plug him in for z there. And now we have all the pieces we need, and we can actually plug in all the specific info, and we can go ahead and solve for dx dt. Sweet. So let's do that. So we have x is, let's see, let's just make sure we have this. We have x is 10, right? So we have 10 and dx dt is a plus one. So we can just have a positive one. Plus y is going to be, if we come back up here, y is gonna be five and dy dt is three. So we can put those in there. It's five times three. And this is gonna be equal to dz to z, which is going to be 5 root 5, remember, which we found up there just now. And all this is going to be multiplied by our dz dt. And now we just need to solve for dz dt, so we can divide both sides by 5 root 5. What we're going to be left with is dz dt equals, um, we're going to have 10, we're going to have 10 plus 15 is 25, 25 divided by 5 root 5. which we can simplify a little further if we'd like, which will give us five over the square root of five. And I don't really care about rationalizing, so that's that. And of course, don't forget, we'll need our units, right? So the units for this are always going, are gonna be, uh, we're just gonna have a units per second, because that's all the units of rate, units of rates that we've got up here, right? So uh, if you notice dx dt is units per second, dy dt is units per second, uh, so this guy is also going to be units per second. Your, since this is a rate, you will always have something over a unit of time. So that's our final answer. But before we wrap this up, I want to do a quick spot check. Right? So let's do a quick spot check. And the purpose of the spot check is to verify if our sign makes sense. So we want to check if our sign makes sense, right? So this is a positive quantity, right? So that's dz dt we've solved for, the dz dt we've solved for is a positive quantity, right? So let's see if that makes sense in the context of the problem, right? So if we look back up here, notice that as these two dots move away from each other, what's happening to the side length z? Well, it would get bigger and bigger, right? So as these dots move further and further apart, you can imagine that the distance between them would keep getting bigger. So therefore, it would make sense for dz dt to be positive. And that is exactly what we have. So that makes sense, yeah? So this, our sign does make sense. So that's a, a nice little way to check your answer, to, to take a quick check and make sure that your answer actually makes sense. If you had a negative number there, you probably made a mistake in your math somewhere down the road. So you wanna go and check that again. But yeah, so that's basically how we'd walk through uh, related rates problems, and um, I will have a few more practice problem videos coming up. Uh, will be those will give you some extra the option to see some more kinds of problems, work those out, and um, yeah, best of luck. Again, this is a challenging problem, but with enough practice, if you follow the right steps, you will do great. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, and check out some other videos. See you next time.